So I am John Michael Bailey. I am with Wellspring Digital. And this, my friends, is the Wellspring Digital chat where uh, we've uh, perfected the art of working. And uh, so what we do is we inhabit the brain through a, an ancient art of marketing people, marketing experts. We inhabit their brain. We steal all the good stuff. And then we, and then we're gone and they don't know. And everybody's, everybody's cool about it. Um, I don't think we're breaking any laws. What am I left with? Do I still have the, no, it's still there. We're not taking okay. it. It's kind of like when you, um, control uh, C, not control X. Okay. I'm, I'm good with that. So okay. copy and paste here. Copy and paste. Do it. So, uh, yeah, I've been watching uh, way too much Game of Thrones. Anyway, our <laughs> guest today is uh, always in uh, the top marketers lists that I see. Uh, she's one of my favorite writers and a top expert on content strategy and marketing. She's also about 40 minutes from me, so we could have done this in person, but, you know, whatever. Digital's good. Nobody drives anywhere anymore. It's Nobody all drives. Nobody yeah. leaves their house. These are dark days. Yeah. Anyway, presence. Yeah. Ahava, please take a moment to introduce yourself to these fine folks. Sure. I am Ahava Leaptag. I'm the president of Aha Media Group. We are a content company that produces copywriting, custom copywriting, and content marketing for hospitals, healthcare systems, pharmaceutical, health startups, med tech, you name it. If it's healthcare, we do it. And uh, we're a team of 54 strong writers, editors, content strategists, and all the people that run us. So uh, yeah, really thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, that's quite a crew. Yeah. So it's always especially fun for me to talk to content strategists to mainly find out and get to the bottom of the, of the, the, uh, the issue of uh, why content marketing is also god-awful boring. I'm just kidding, of course. Um, the content gonna, conundrum? The content conundrum. Say that five times fast. No, we're only going to talk about the good stuff. Uh, so, you ready? I'm ready. Let's jump in. All right. We've been writing and talking about content mar marketing for years. Content marketing, people love to write and talk about content. It's very meta. I still get that horrible look though from clients when I talk, when I say the word content or writing. Um, what is it about the written word that scares so many people and how can they overcome this fear? Have you ever sat down to write anything? <laughs> <laughs> Blank page. Ah, ding, ding, ding. Uh, do, do you remember your fifth grade writing teacher or your 10th grade writing teacher or your 101 English comp teacher? Do they still have 101 English comp? I don't even know. I don't know. know. I blocked all that out. Yeah. Well, there you I go. Years of therapy and it's gone. So I think for a lot of people, writing is synonymous with conversing in a very awkward way because mm -hmm. we're taught to make it passive, make it sound a certain way, like it belongs in a journal or it belongs in a book or it belongs on my English teacher's desk. When really great writing sounds like a conversation you're having in your head with the person who's writing. Mm -hmm. So, or, you know, reading somebody's writing and feeling like, oh my gosh, they're talking right to me. So I think that that's why people are terrified of writing because they're being asked to take an already abstract thing, which is talking about your thoughts and putting them into a very formulaic sounding experience that they don't feel comfortable with instead of just writing what you would say. Right. And so one of the top things that I tell people is just talk to your phone in a recording device and send it to a transcription company and then just copy and paste and sling some words around, find some, use the thesaurus for some stronger verbs. And, and you know, that's, that's how you're going to get what you need. Cause really you just got to talk the ideas out usually instead of trying to write them out, because I think that constrains the creativity. Do you have to say the word thesaurus? Cause it's difficult. No, you don't have to say it. It's actually a very lovely function in Word, or you can go out to dictionary.com. I mean, there's many, many ways. You can actually open a book. I, I won't stop you from using 
a thesaurus published in, you know, 1962. And uh, yeah, I think that, <laughs> you remember in Say Anything when he opens up her dictionary? Yeah. <laughs> That's a Gen X reference for you listeners. Um, that, so that, that is uh that's a, a symptom of mental illness when you open someone's dictionary and, and there's that level of uh highlighting and bookmarking going on. Give, give him this pen. So anyway, <laughs> I think that <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I don't want to go into sales, I don't want to have anything to do with sales. So anyway, um yeah, that's I don't want to sell anything. I don't want to buy anything that's I don't want to sell my <laughs> We've lost anyone outside of our generation. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Gen Xers are like, yeah, I'm here for it. And the millennials are like, what the heck are they talking about? <laughs> Say anything, my friends. It's a classic. Even it's a great for movie. You, even for you. So I think that, um, yeah, no, you can, you don't have to say the word thesaurus. You can just use one. Fair um, enough. I'm fine with that. So it, writing already being a scary subject, you've you've now taken writing fear to the next level and, and spe specialize in healthcare content. So as if regular content wasn't daunting enough. Um, but can you talk about the effects of the pandemic on healthcare content? And if you think uh, Google Eat matters more than ever, Google Eat is expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. So I think what so epidemiologists and historians are going to write about this pandemic for the next 1,000 years if the, uh, yeah. planet, if the planet makes it that long right. or wherever we're living, you know, before we moved to Saturn, kids, and we lived on Earth. So I think that one of the things that we saw was that the countries that were most productive in lockdowns and rules about coronavirus and COVID and then that therefore affected their public health were those that communicated very plainly with the public about it. So Australia, New Zealand, there was, you know, Denmark, Sweden, some of those countries, the Nordic countries, I believe, um, were able to do that. Now, I couldn't look at their websites because I don't have um, fluency in their languages, but I did look at New Zealand and Australia's um, health, public health websites really carefully. And then I looked at public health websites in the United States, including the CDC, the state of New York, the state of Illinois, the state of California, and I believe DC. And I had looked at the state of Maryland because, you know, I was just looking at it for myself and that's right. where I live, my own public consumption. But what I found was that we did a poor job of communicating clearly. And the number one thing I think we did wrong was that we never had an honest conversation with the American public where we said, maybe no one's ever told you this before, but science only can know what it knows up until that moment, just like mm. everybody else in life. And so this is, and, and they would use terms like this is a rapidly evolving situation. I mean, you put the word evolution into any sentence and you've lost 50% of the population. <laughs> so I think that we were not smart about from the very beginning saying to people, we're only going to know what we know on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Mm. And on Wednesday at nine o'clock, we may know more things. We may actually know things that disagree with what we knew on Tuesday at 5 p.m. And that's what this kind of situation is. And um, I think that while that would have been scary for people to hear, I think it would have set expectations. And so what ended up happening was public trust and patience ran out very quickly. Right. So the first thing about writing for healthcare is that you have to build trust with your audience. And so when you come around to the conversation around eat, which is what Google looks for from trust, from a robot perspective and the way that Google runs back, you know, their back end code, I don't know that eat is really um, something that you can get at from a human cognitive perspective. You can certainly get at it from a ranking and a metric perspective, but mm -hmm. the Kaiser Family Foundation ran, ran a study and found out that the CDC's website lost nine points in credibility with the American public. Wow. So, you know, for Google, you know, CDC, I mean, that's the gold standard, yeah. but for people, it stopped being the gold standard. So when you're writing for health, any kind of health care, you better make sure you know what you're talking about. You better make sure you have facts. You better make sure you have backlinking to sources. But I also think you have to understand that just because you can control what's coming up in organic search or influencing what comes up in organic search, 
you can't necessarily influence the fact that people may not trust you anymore. So it doesn't really matter if Google thinks you're great. Nobody's going to look at your website because they don't trust you anymore. Now, do you think that, so this is healthcare content, but do you think for the average business person that they still need to worry about expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness with their content? You know, I think it's a really, I think it depends what you sell. Like, are you mm -hmm. selling pencils? Then, I mean, I don't know if you say your lead is sourced from, you know, Minnesota and it actually, I have no idea, but it's sourced from China and you're lying about it. I, I mean, I don't know. Do I think that you need to think about it from an SEO perspective on Google says the best practices around eat are a hundred percent. Do I think there's an infodemic out there? A hundred percent. Do I think Google is going to get into the business of censoring things? Yes, because they're already doing it. Mm -hmm. And while I find myself on the socially liberal side of things, I also feel like once big tech gets into censorship, we are walking an extremely fine line, even though in their well-published defense, they are trying to help public health and the public by doing so. But, you know, free speech is a big problem across the world. And I think Americans delude themselves if they don't think that it's a problem here as well, because we're not, even though, you know, free market says the government shouldn't get involved. I think at this point, some legislation is necessary. This podcast, by the way, is sponsored by the good people of Minnesota the lead capital of the world. So during the height of the pandemic, you made the bold decision to ungate your healthcare content. So in the age of marketing automation, uh, we got to have that email address, right? So can you talk about the effects of your ungating decision, ungate gate, um, and share your thoughts on gating content in general? So, well, the good people of Minnesota sent me an email and said, you should probably ungate your content because we, <laughs> we don't want people using their pencils writing in their email addresses. Um, so this is what happened. What happened is, is that I was sitting at this very desk. That plant wasn't there yet. Um, that's fake, by the way. And um, <laughs> that is from China. <laughs> and um, I don't think the good people of Minnesota grow orchids but you know who knows maybe they do there's uh, there's gonna be a lot of work on minnesota the state of minnesota i'm gonna write my fourth grade book report on that so i was sitting here and i completely felt like totally just devastated and useless and all the adjectives that describe somebody who didn't feel like she could control or influence any situation at this point and clients were telling us these terrible sob stories and it was just you know you just felt like, what am I going to do with my life? Right. So right away, we created that plain language cheat sheet because I said to my staff, if we're having trouble writing about this, you better believe that all the people that have to write about this for the first time are having trouble writing about it. So we created a plain language cheat sheet on like commonly used terms in COVID and what they really mean. We won two awards for it. So very, okay. very, very proud of that piece of work. But what happened was we were looking at our statistics and it was like not enough people were down. Like in the beginning, you know, you get like 500 downloads in a week. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's doing well. And then, you know, it starts to trickle down and trickle down. And you're like, I thought thousands of people would want this thing because thousands of people have to write about this. So I said to my team, let's just ungate it all. Like if we truly believe that our mission is to empower people to make the most important decisions of their lives, the only way that's going to happen is if healthcare communicators feel empowered to communicate clearly. So let's empower them. Right. And that's what we did. We ungated it and our social media following went up and our email subscription list went up. And I don't know, it just, it seemed like it worked for us and our business. Um, we're getting ready to produce something specifically for our hospital clients. And, um, you know, I think the conversation is going to come up with my marketing team. Like, do you want to gate this? And I'm like, no, because here's the thing. Here's the thing about content marketing. If you gate it, and I don't think this works in a big Fortune 500 company. No, no VP of marketing. Like, oh, you know, I don't care. But the truth of the matter is, is that the leads who are interested are going to reach out. And the leads who aren't interested are not. And are they going to continue to be nurtured with you? Well, one would hope that after reading a quality piece of content, they're going to want to follow you and know more about you and learn more about you. If they're not, are you really missing out on a major nurturing opportunity? I don't know. For my business, I made a decision. Um, I don't think it's right the right decision for every business. I don't believe in best practices for everybody. Um, 
But I do believe that there might be a value in your own organization, good listeners who have paused and go, watched an hour and a half of Say Anything, that uh, let us know how you felt about the boombox scene, yeah. um, that there might be a couple of pieces that you want to try on gating and watch what happens. So, you know, just just my own experience share. Yeah, I, I, I mean, my school of thought tends to be that I, I want to get the content out there. I, I truly, you know, this might sound like BS, but I truly, really want to help people with with the content that that I produce and, and that we produce here at Wellspring. So because um, I agree, I think I think the more you become a resource, a trusted resource to clients and potential clients and even people who are never going to be clients, you're still, you know, your 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 uh, reputation gets gets that bump. Um, and whether it's electronic or, or in real life, I think, I, I think that matters. Definitely. Yeah, I do also, I, but I do think that there are, or, there are cases to be made to argue against ungating it. For example, right. let's say you create like a custom research report mm -hmm. and you really only want to share that with the mark, you know, the, the share of your market, that's really going to be interested in communicating with you on a regular basis. I could see somebody saying, making that argument. A plain language cheat sheet. I mean, that isn't created to drive leads. That's created to help. And therefore, I don't think that it should be gated. The content okay. gating debate. The gate debate. The gate debate. Nobody's debated. Nobody deb nobody's debated with me about it. Everybody's been like, that's super cool that you did that. Maybe behind my back, they're telling me, like, I'm, you know, like, wow, how this business is built. But, She's um, out of her mind. <laughs> But to my face, they're like, you go, girl. So, All right. So let's talk about thought leadership. So um, there's no sort of shortage of bloggers out there trying to write, you know, controversial or groundbreaking stuff. And, you know, in a busy world, is actionable content a better strategy for your businesses than trying to be groundbreaking all the time? Or, you know, is there power in both? I just want to get you to weigh in on this because I, I have who, my opinion. Who's groundbreaking right now? <laughs> well, that's a good point. There's a lot of people trying to be groundbreaking. They, they think they're groundbreaking. They're right. Um, the last groundbreaking article that I read was from Mark Schaefer where he talks about content shock. <laughs> that was basically like, fold it all up, kids. <laughs> um... I had a feeling that was going to be what you were going to say, too. Really? Oh, that's yeah, so totally. Yeah. Huh. Um, what, what was the question? <laughs> I mean, really, what I'm asking about is actionable content. It, you know, yeah. is it is I, at the end of the day, you know, are you going to get more from challenging somebody or or from from helping them out i don't know i guess that's a kind of an unfair way to ask the question because i'm no, sort of leading the witness I, yeah, <laughs> I think you're asking me a legitimate question and the answer is is that i think it depends what you do and who you're talking to so i have friends in my space that are more successful than i am that sell enterprise level solutions and they talk to cmos mm -hmm. that's their sales technique cmos are now aware of me and want to get to know me better because they are much more aware of their content programs and they see that that's a challenge in their organization. But most of the time, the hiring decisions will come down to the directors of digital or to the marketing managers or to the, you know, managers of those types of teams because they're the ones making those sort of decisions. When I create actionable content for practitioners, I'm not selling. I'm building a brand and building an awareness that I'm a value, that AHA Media Group can be a value to their company. The practitioners aren't going to hire us because they're the ones doing the work. They don't want an outside consulting firm to come in. Hmm. Here's the secret about practitioners. They get promoted and they, you know, think about who's going to be able to help me grow my team and grow what I'm doing. So I think that when you're selling something like I'm selling, which is cons consultative cons Consulting solutions, oh, forget it. Sound it out. Guys, I just want to, <laughs> want to know it's Monday, okay? Right. So let's, yeah. let's, let's be, go easy on us here. Let's be fair. Um, thank you. Um, if I'm doing, if I'm selling consulting, but I'm also selling tactical, then I have to think about content for every level that I'm selling to, not just actionable content. 
Now there's actionable content for CMOs also. I mean, I don't, I don't sure. disagree that that exists. In fact, one of the pieces we're about to produce is what your CMO needs to know about CRM. So I, I definitely think that there's, there's a place for both, but I think, you know, you, you need to be looking at a mix of types of content. Do I think actionable content is going to get people's attention more than eyebrow raising content or controversial content? Probably not. It's sexier to have a controversy. Um, Sorry. No, I and that's fair. That's and, your opinion. No, I I agree. I agree. I think it's fair. I mean, I you know, absolutely. Um, you know, you're not gonna go viral. You know, content shock went viral because Mark challenged the status quo. Um, but what's the he last also built an entire uh you know sort of marketing system off of that. Yeah, so let me ask you a question. What's the last um, controversial thing you read? Oh, man. Crap. I should have known you were going to You can really remember, because I can't. That's the last thing I read that I thought was really controversial. Yeah, the only thing that, that stands out to me is, is the content shock one. You know, I read a lot of content out there, especially for marketers, where they're trying to be... Um, they're trying to create some sort of the next content shock type article yeah, well nobody has because what mark basically said was what you're doing is not going to get you where you want to go and then right. he said okay now do this and that's going to get you on where you want to go and by the way that's more content so i agree with you and i love mark and i think he's a stand-up person and i think he has a lot of really great creative ideas i i don't know that he even knew it i i think even if you ask him he'll tell you he didn't realize it was gonna yeah happen. no he you never know when you write that kind yeah. of stuff um what i'll say is that I will say the last controversial thing I heard was Joe Polizzi likes to talk about um, like getting into like tilt coins and Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> this is his new thing. So that was kind of something where I was like, what is happening right now? But um, anyway. Dwayne Forrester is big on that too. So all these marketing guys are like getting obsessed with Bitcoins and NFTs and it's funny. I know. Good for them. Hey, um, hey. So happy that they have extra income. <laughs> <laughs> to screw around with just trying to, i'm just trying to you know buy pencils with lead um so i For that minneapolis minnesota send pencils lead capital of the world appreciate it thank you maybe they can get target to make a donation so <laughs> i um I think that consistency and thoughtfulness is really the answer towards driving a successful business. You know who does a kick-ass job of this? Anne Handley. Amen. Anne Handley writes this phenomenal newsletter every two weeks. If you don't have it signed up, go to annhandley.com, H-A-N-D-L-E-Y. She spells her name with only one, two A. It's what is a the newsletter? I'm blanking on the, new, the name of the newsletter, and it's awesome. Anarchy. Total anarchy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. And it's like... Um, I happen to be besties with Anne. She's really one of my good friends. I text with her several times a week. And um, so, name drop. Name drop. Yeah. But um, she, I like when I read it, I just crack up because she just she says the funniest things and she she really connects with her audience and she's the exact. You know, when you asked me that thing about don't be afraid of writing, I was thinking about her and how like when she writes, she really spends a lot of time thinking about how she wants to sound in somebody's head. Mm. And so, from my perspective. She's the type of person who she's writing about the same things every two weeks. She has a fresh take on them. And the point of the newsletter really was so that people would know that she was available for speaking and to keep people nurtured so that the next time she releases a book, they'll be excited to buy it. And she grew that list to 40,000 people over two years. It's like incredible growth. Like any company in the world would be so thrilled. But her last email newsletter is about how she did it. She spends eight hours on a newsletter. Eight, eight hours. And those newsletters maybe are a thousand words long, if. So when you read about that, it really brings you to an appreciation of what really great writing looks like and what it should sound like and all that kind of good stuff. So I guess for me, I admire that kind of thing way more than I admire a once in a lifetime blog post that went viral. Because, but here we are still talking about it. So yeah. I don't know, but the point is, is that I would rather much have that kind of input and um, influence on an industry than one 
blog post that freaked a lot of people out and then didn't really change anything about what people did. Amen, sister. By the way, um, anyone who does the chicken dance during their, uh, their, uh, their keynote speeches, which Anne does, um, is okay in my book. Yeah, totally. totally. And rules. Huh. Totally. See she what does. I did there? And rules, content rules. Anyway, so um, in a recent Content Marketing Institute article, you were quoted as saying that the post-pandemic is, and this was challenging someone else's opinion, your best chance to enhance your relationships with current customers and show them what they mean to you. So I spoke to Shanali Burke and, ding, 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 Mark Schaefer uh, about H2H. Oh, name dropping. You just yeah. Shanali and Mark, they're like, so I spoke to Shanali and Mark, uh, two wonderful people, really close to me, um, just lovely people, and 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 we talk all the time. But anyway, um, I, I spoke to them about, about H2H, or human-to-human -human marketing, as opposed to B2B or B2C. So did the pandemic make us more human? Can our marketing be altruistic, or have we learned nothing? We've learned nothing. Oh! Sorry, Minnesota. What can I tell you? We screwed the pooch. We did. You want me to elaborate, I assume. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> I mean, do I want to? I, <laughs> I just think that, first of all, it's too soon to tell. There's just right. no way to know that. Um, I think that we'd like to think we became more human to human. Um, but even when I published the ungating article and Drew Davis wrote about it and Andy wrote about it and Anne wrote about it, and there were a lot of challenges to that idea on LinkedIn. I mean, everybody was like, go girl, but there were a lot of like, that wouldn't work for us or which I think is totally fair, you know? Right. Um, but I think that we, we'd like to be more human. I think we've become more casual in our marketing. Um, I think yeah. the tones have changed and the sense of humor is different. Um, and I think the sensitivity, you know what? Here's what I want to say. I think what really changed is Black Lives Matter. I think the social justice summer that we experienced as a culture actually probably made us more human. Yeah. I um, do I think that marketing is really going to over go an entire overhaul and change that much? No, I don't. I think business is business. I think that executives like numbers that are round and green at the end of the spreadsheet. I think that the political crisis in this country is at a breaking point. I think that we are um, at a time when we should realize that we're more connected than ever and what we do affects another person. We are beyond selfish and rude and, you know, creating these big walls between us to have conversations as possible. So no, I'm not so hopeful. Sorry to say. Yeah. I, and I wonder, <clears throat> I agree. I, I, yeah, I think we've learned nothing. Um, I think there are, uh, there are definitely uh, exceptions. By the way, we'll be here all year, people, to make you feel good. So, yeah. you know, drop in any time. But I, see, I personally believe, and I think you believe this as well, and, and, and this is actually to borrow uh, uh, the tagline from one of Mark's books is the most human company wins. And I, I believe that there, yes, you can, you can gate content, you can monetize stuff, you can make money, but you can also do it by being human and by having empathy for yeah, the needs true. of your customers. But I don't think, I think that's complete bullshit. Name the top 10 companies in the world. Do you really think they're human? Walmart, yeah. Apple. Is he talking about from a marketing perspective, the most human company wins? How could you measure something like that? There are literally nine touch points that have to happen before consumers even aware that you're alive. And you're making me alive. sad, but you're right. I, I don't mean to make you sad, but I think Mark is talking about an aspirational idea, which is beautiful. And I think that that's what people like Mark Schaefer do is they write books and they tell people, we want you to think and focus on this. And people read those books and they do that for about two weeks or two months. And then they give up because it's too hard to push that rock up a hill. Right. So I don't agree. I mean, I think Mark wants that to be true. And I think he has great cases in his book that prove that it can be true, but I don't think it's true. The company that does the best is the company that have executives that are focused on sales and talent. 
That is what Harvard Business Review would tell you. And I'm willing to put my money on Harvard Business Review. So no, not the most human company wins. I'm sorry to sound so cynical because I'm, no, that's okay. I'm in healthcare. I 100% believe in that. And I think you have to sound that way. But I don't think, I think when you're a marketer and you're not aware of how a company makes money and how important that is to a company, then you are missing the entire thrust of what your job it is to do to educate your audiences, which to explain to them, figure out how the company makes money and figure out a way that you can help them make more money because that's really your job as a marketer. And I think most marketers are not trained to think that way and they don't understand that. I agree. I And 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 don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not, you know, this living in this fairy tale world where, where I think, you know, empathy is the root of all marketing success, but I do believe that some empathy is required. I um, think, don't get me wrong. I think all the empathy, yeah, I think all yeah. the empathy is required. The empathy starts in the marketing department and then it goes to this department and it gets cut right. heads, and then it goes to this department. So if you start with none, you're going to end up with none. Right. Right. But I, I definitely think empathy for your audiences is important, but when we're talking about healthcare, there's a lot of times where we're selling a product that people have to buy at a really crappy time in their lives. Yeah. Like, I just got diagnosed with cancer. Now I have to go learn everything I can about cancer so that I can live. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of empathy that you need a lot of empathy. And I think the most human hospitals probably win, but to overall say the most human companies win, I don't necessarily think that's true. Look at, like I said, Apple, Microsoft, Walmart, Google. Do you think these are the most human companies? No. I don't. They're too big to be human. Yeah. They're companies. So they're anyway. cyborgs. I don't know if they're cyborgs, but they're definitely Mark, run by Mark, people. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Zuckerberg? Mark Zuckerberg is a cyborg. I'm convinced he, of it. You think he sold his soul to the devil? I think he sold his soul to a, a, a computer system that, uh, you know, Mark six of nine or whatever it's called on, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the Borg. <laughs> you know what really irritates me about Mark Zuckerberg? Mark Zuckerberg has daughters. Yeah. He had research on his desk that said Instagram causes self-esteem issues for young girls and he didn't do anything about it. Yo, Mark. Yeah. That's, you're that's to this. Can you call in? Yeah. Yeah. We call that evil meta. All right. Well, Ahava, thank you so much. There's a lot of great depressing the hell out of you. What's that? Depressing the hell. Thank you for. We talked about Minnesota. Uh, we talked about Black Lives Matter. Oh, wait, I do want to say one really good thing that I think is important is that okay. this is something Jay Bear says, and I actually think Jay is 100 percent right about that. I think the pan, you know, in Chinese, he doesn't say this part. I'm just editorializing here building on Jay's point. In Chinese, the same character for chaos is the same character for opportunity. And I think what the pandemic did was it, and the social justice thing, it threw everything up in the air. And I think that it gives people a tremendous amount of opportunity now. Hairdressers, manicurists, um, restaurants, um, you know, shopping sites online, um, technology, healthcare, doctors, practitioners, all that stuff, people are willing to move now. They're willing to move right. where they actually live. And so I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for businesses to really get their value proposition right, to laser-like focus on the clients that are going to bring them the most success, whatever that looks like for that company, whether it's you know a, a hairdresser loving what she's doing because she's helping people look their best and she only wants to work with little boys who want to have mohawks. You know what I mean? Like whatever it is, that's I think where as a marketer you should be excited is like, I finally have the chance to really define who we are in the marketplace and go after those people and target them and get them. And that's where I think there's a tremendous amount of hope and excitement. Um, and I and I hope that that's what people take away from this lovely interview where we made <laughs> fun of everything we could think of. Um, but no, I really, I really do because I, I really do believe honestly that if we look back and we think we learned anything, it's that we learned to tighten our focus. By the way, every name you've dropped in this interview is a past guest. Well, then I've joined the ranks of the fabulous. So there right. you go. There Boom. you go. So I, why am I only on now? <laughs> it took it took ungating my content for you to be like, oh, yep. maybe she's a worthwhile ad. 
See, we'll, there's we'll power. Put it on the, week, the week of Thanksgiving, and it'll be like eh, three listeners. But those three listeners. Sweet. All right. So, hey, I want you, when you're, when you're um, sitting down, uh, you know, family's over for Thanksgiving and you're writing out your, your, who you're thankful list with your Minnesota pencil. I want you to think about this interview and how wonderful it was and how you, through this interview, were able to help the audience. Those three people in Minnesota. Those three people in Minnesota. I, you know what? I am th so, so thankful for you, listeners. You're fantastic. I hope you feel like you learned something. I hope you're inspired to either rewatch or watch Say Anything. Buy yes. local. Even if you don't live in Minnesota, please, <laughs> for your Christmas shopping list, patronize a Minnesota local business. Um, I They have that cheese. That's Wisconsin, right? Uh, yeah, what does Minnesota have? Cold? They have links. They, they have sell. Links. They sell boxes and, of cold. Hey, here's the here's the thing. You can patronize. They have prints. Well, they have right? prints. Right, you could patronize Target. It is a local business. <laughs> oh, this just went down. Bill. Bye, All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye.